Welcome to the Read Aloud for today. We are going to continue reading from where we left off in the text along the Santa Fe Trail, Marion Russell's own story. Remember, so far we have read about how Marion's journey began on the Santa Fe Trail and that her mother worked out a deal that she would cook for the men on the journey in order to save the money for the passage to Santa Fe. We've heard about the wagons and towards the end of our last Read Aloud, we were being told about how the train of wagons would take a rest at noon and the men would nap in the shade of their wagons, the mules would rest, and then after the rest, the trains of wagons would start back up again. I am going to start from there on page on page 16 in your book if you are following along. As I read page 16, I want you to visualize in your mind's eye what you are hearing. Try to picture exactly what the text is describing in your own mind. The vast open country that is gone from us forever rippled like a silver sea in the sunshine. Running across that sea of grass were bu the buffalo trails, narrow paths worn deep into the earth. There were seldom they were seldom more than eight inches across and always ran north to south. A buffalo is a wise animal. It knows instinctively that water flows eastward away from the Rocky Mountains and that the nearest way to running water is always north to south. Scattered along the buffalo trails were the buffalo wallows, were the buffalo wallows, small lagoons of rainwater like turquoise beads strung on a dark brown string. They were made by buffalo bulls fighting. The bulls would put their heads together and slowly walk round and round, making a depression that caught the rainwater. Always there were buffalo. Our trail often led among herds of buffalo, so numerous that at times we were half afraid. After reading this text, did you, could you tell what the scene may look like? Did you picture it in your mind? Let me see if you were close. Let's take a look at the illustration that shows what the text was depicting. Were you close? Did you see the buffalo wallows, the seas of grass, and the herds of buffalo? How does visualizing help us as readers? Well, visualizing helps us as readers to better comprehend or understand the text we're reading. As we're reading a text, it's good to visualize what the words are trying to tell us. All right, let's continue. Frightening thunderstorms came up suddenly. The drivers would wheel the wagon so that the mules backs were to the storm. The men who had been walking, sought shelter with the women and children inside. The prairies would darken and a sheet of drenching water would fall from the skies upon us. A fine white mist would come through the tightened canvas and soon small pearls glistened in the mother's hair. Then as suddenly as it had come, the storms would pass away. We would emerge from, then from the wagons to out, stretch out our cramped limbs. Always we saw our storm, a tattered beggar, limping across the distant hills. One evening, a great rainbow flashed through the sunlit rain. I called out to Mother, who stood on the wagon tongue. Will, who was busy kindling a cooking fire, said some, with some eloquence, There is always a pot of gold at the end of each rainbow. Mother, is it really true about the pot of gold? I asked. Mother smiled. The end of the rainbow is always much farther away than it seems, my dear. We can only follow the rainbow and hope that it leads to the fame and fortune. For years, I thought that the end of the rainbow was in California. 
At sunset, the prairie sky flared into unbelievable beauty, with long streamers of red and gold flung out across it. Each night, there were two great circles of wagons. Each, inside each great circle, the mules were turned after grazing, for ropes were stretched between the wagons and a circular corral made. The cooking fires were inside the corral. Between the two night circles formed by the wagons was a no man's land, which the children used as a playground. The ball games that went on there, the games of leapfrog and dare base. And sometimes far away, we heard the war whoop of the Indians. Men stood on guard each night, rifles in hand. They circled and recircled the big corrals. After the evening meal, we would gather around the little fires. The men would tell stories of strange new land before us, tales of gold and of Indians. One night, when the wind was blowing, Captain Aubrey came and held me on his lap. I felt the great black night closing upon, down upon us and heard the voice of the wind, night wind, as it swept across the turbulent prairie. I shivered in the captain's arms, thinking that the only that only in the circle of the firelight that flickered on mother's face was their warmth and comfort and home. While the most while most of the drivers slept under the wagons, the women and children slept inside the wagons or in tents. Each night we pitched our tent close to the wagon and it spread its dark wings over the three of us. It was easy to hear Pierre snoring outside. Our bed on the matted grass was comfortable, but sometimes in the night I would awaken to hear the coyote's eerie cry in the darkness. Then I would creep close to mother. Our long caravan loaded with heavy, valuable merchandise to be sold in the West traveled slowly. Sometimes we were alarmed by the Indians. Sometimes we were threatened by storms and it always seemed, always it seemed we suffered for the want of water. I remember so clearly the beauty of the earth and how as we bore westward, the deer and antelope bounded away from us. There were miles and miles of buffalo grass, blue lagoons and blood red sunsets. And once in a while on the lonely prairie, a little sod house the home of some hunter or trapper. We paused at Pawnee Rock and Camp Mackey, then moved on. Babies were born as our wagons lumbered westward. Death sometimes came. After about a month, we were on the Cimarron Cutoff. We built our fires with buffalo chips. My chore was to gather the chips. I would stand back and kick them and then reach down and gather them carefully for underneath lived big spiders and centipedes. Sometimes scorpions ran out. I would fill my long full skirt with an evening's fuel and take it back to mother. It was on this trip that I made my first acquaintances with the big hairy spider called a tarantula. They lived in holes in the ground. When we found such a hole, we would stamp on the ground and say, tarantula, tarantula, come out, come out. Tell us what it's all about. And sure enough, they would come out walking on stilt like legs. Okay, so that's the end of the read aloud for today. I hope you enjoyed and have a great day.